I really believe that we are in the end times. I believe that we are at the threshold of the 70th week of Daniel, which those 70 weeks represented seven year cycles, Shemitahs is what he was talking about. It's what he was referring to. So because we we fulfilled 69 of them from that time and there's just one left. One seven year cycle, one Shemitah. And you got to understand about Shemitahs. I'm going to talk a little bit about Shemitahs and Jubilees today. I'm going to look at it in the Hebrew so you're about to get a Hebrew lesson, just a little one, <laughs> a scratching the surface thing. But um it's important that we understand the Hebraic mindset, the, the heavenly ways of God. Because God is the one that spoke all these things. God is the one that created them and established them for us. So why do you do that? Well, it goes back to this one thing. God's looking for a family. God's looking for sons and daughters that he will live with forever in a garden. Just as it was in the beginning, it shall be in the ending. I believe that with all of my heart. And that garden is called an ecclesia in the Greek. It's called a kahal in the Hebrew. And what that is, is basically a place where we're friends. Where we assemble as friends, brothers and sisters, but also friends. Friends with one another and friends with God. That's an ecclesia, but it, the purpose is not to gather. The purpose is to govern. That's the difference. That's the difference between watered down, I'll be nice, lukewarm, so-called churches, and the true ecclesias of God. We don't gather, we govern. And that's where two or three are gathered. It's all, that's all that, ma it doesn't matter to God. It's not about... It's not about the numbers. That's what, it's, it's not about that. The significance is according to the spirit. Doing what God is telling you to do. In the moment that he's telling you to do it. Second Chronicles 7, 14 and 15. I'm reminded right now. Come on, in that place, God hears our prayers. And he answers from heaven. That's an ecclesia. That's a place where you ascend, where heaven and earth become one again. And we're joined to the Lord, one spirit with him. It's a place where we make vows. It's a place where the oil is poured out. It's a place of shalom, where all the chaos is destroyed or brought back. Disorder is brought back into ordinal perfection. There's for Sean. The Lord is speaking that word to him today. Everything that was in disorder and dismay and disarray is brought back into divine order. Everything lining up. Come on, agreement and alignment. Agreement with God brings alignment with God. And we align with him. Then he releases the authority to move and make the decree to reestablish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. That's how it works. With Jesus Christ as the cornerstone of what God is building. He's the cornerstone of the church. Of the ecclesia. Of his family. Thank you Lord. So I'm going to get into this real quick. I don't. I really want to be quick. But I believe that. Hmm, when you're talking about Shemitahs. It's seven year cycle. So the Shemitah is actually the seventh year of that seven year cycle. And then you have a first year following, which is a year of new beginnings. And I believe that's why so many people have been feeling this new beginning. You know, we say it all the time in the new year and the beginning of the Hebrew year in Nisan 1. Just felt so strongly about this new beginning. That it was different than every other new beginning. That this was really the new beginning. The beginning of the ending, I believe. It's a new beginning of a new ending. How about that? How about a new ending this time on this seven-year cycle? How about a new ending that ushers Jesus Christ back in as the king of glory that sits upon a throne in Jerusalem <laughs> to rule and reign out of that place forever, and we're with him. We are caught up and meet him in the air, just like the Bible says. 
But see, my, my theology after that's a little bit different. Because I'm not looking to get out of here. I'm looking to take over here. But I need my commander in chief in order to do that. I can win some battles, but there's some that we need him to lead us into the battle. <laughs> and he's coming because he said he was. And I believe he comes. And I believe that in the next Hebrew year, 5783, which will begin at Rosh Hashanah this September. I'm not sure what the date is in September on the Gregorian calendar, but it's coming. That would begin at 5783, which I believe is the beginning of the ending. That's the beginning of a new um, Shemitah cycle. I believe that right now we're in a Shemitah, but it's also a Jubilee year. So we're actually in a, a first year of a new Shemitah cycle. How many of you are glad that 2021 we see the closing of one and we see the opening of something new? Because right after a seven, seven, seven Shemitahs, 49 years comes the 50th, which is the great Jubilee, which is what I believe we're entering into. Time of the great Jubilee right now. All the numbers add up and point to that. So from there, from the year of the great Jubilee, then there's, a, there's one more week of Daniel. There's one more seven-year period called the tribulation. <laughs> See, because I don't think we're... Some people are waiting to get raptured and think it's going to happen this year, taken out. Well, I believe that God is going to teach us how to be raptured daily. We can be raptured, caught up. That's all that word means. It's not even in the Bible. Caught up. King James guys put that in there. Caught up. We can be caught up every day. Paul was caught up into the third heaven. John was caught. He saw a door and was caught up into the throne room of God. Enoch was caught up but didn't come back. Turkey, he could have come back. No, God kept him. God loved him that much. He said, no, you're done. I love you. Just stay with me. We'll do it from here. We'll get the job done. My son's coming. Hallelujah. And so, the Shemitah and the Jubilee, I believe, are, are important. And so, God chooses words carefully. He chooses the Hebrew words carefully. He puts the living letters, which are actually his words, his voice. He combines them, joins them together to form what we would call words. These letter structures, these little armies, if you will. He assembles them together perfectly to work on our behalf. So when we decree that thing, it is established. When we release his word, his voice. We release what's in the Father's heart straight out of the pure DNA of God. It's what the letters are. The 22 living letters. I don't have time to go. I could teach on that one time if you'd like. But it would take a little more than one time. But it's deep. But it's really good. But anyway, God chooses words, chooses the letters that he wanted to use very carefully when he spoke them. Okay. So. Um, in Genesis 6, 3, it talks about, well, I probably should just, let me read that. Let's open up my phone. Thank you, Gio. Oh, I just got that message I was looking for a while ago. Hallelujah. In Genesis 6, 3, let's just start in one. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, daughters were born unto them. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men. Now these sons of God we understood from the previous chapter. These were the fallen angels. The third of the angels that were cast out of heaven with Lucifer. When Lucifer fell as lightning into this realm. Was cast out of the heavenly realms into this realm. The realm of the earth. The realm of the kingdom of the earth. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they, they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, that's called perversion. Okay, that's called demonic. And I'm not sure how it happened, how all that worked. All I know is that those spirits were able to take on some kind of form or substance in order to, um, I'll just say, mate with the daughters of men. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. That is a very important Scripture right there. The Lord said, 
that his spirit will not always strive with man. And what this is leading up is to the first mention of the number 120 in the Bible. And that is a very significant number. And so in a, in a, in a fulfilling of 120, you're going to find right at the end, at the fullness of it, that the Spirit of God is striving with man. Trying to bring man back, trying to, to redeem mankind, trying to come, you know, pull you, draw you away from the sin. Turn your heart back towards God. But he said that his spirit would not always strive with man for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. Now the Bible scholars all or most agree. Because this would contradict what God said that man would live 70 to 80 years before that. And so it's not talking about 120 years as we would think. It's talking about a year as in Jubilee years. 120, 50 year cycles. You got to think like God thinks. He thinks and God thinks differently than we do. His ways are higher than our ways. That doesn't mean that you can't understand them. That means to the carnal mind, to the natural man, you cannot understand them. So unless you're born of the Spirit, you cannot understand spiritual things. They're foolishness to them. Somebody, was, we were, J Travis was talking to me earlier about some things. It's foolishness to them. If we, that, you know, God gives us a pearl and, and we throw it before the swine. Guess what? They're, they're not going to receive it. They're going to, you know, retaliate against you and call you names and whatever. But God works in these cycles in these patterns. Patterns in the Bible are equal to prophecy. They are prophesying to us. Is what I'm saying. So look for the patterns. The pattern of the 120 is found. I found there's more than that. But there's three significant places. And the first one is right here in Genesis 6.3. Where he says I'm going to give you 120 years. I believe that means 120 jubilees. So 120 times 50 is what? Somebody do the math. Real quick, 6,000 years, 120 times 50, 6,000 years. So he said, the spirit is only going to strive with man up until that time. And after that, it's over. <laughs> something's going to shift at the end of that. Something's going to change. You say, well, we've we already passed the year 2000. No, but we don't understand when it began. When God instituted this was when sin entered in. That's when God's time clock began to tick. That's when the countdown began, or the count up began. When God had a purpose and a plan and a timing for everything, He had set times called moeds, plural, moedims. Okay? And so, God's clock. The first time I ever saw God's clock, well, the first message He gave me was when we was in the little chapel. That little room over there is full of junk now. <laughs> storage room. But the Lord began to speak to me about there's a destiny clock on the inside of you, Don. I have placed my clock in your heart. And this was years ago. This was uh, years ago. I don't even know. 20, 20 something years ago. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm resetting your destiny clock. I'm bringing you into perfect timing. I'm bringing you into that perfect order with me. Perfect timing. Perfect alignment with me. God has a clock. He's placed it on the inside of us. It's in our hearts. That it has to be activated through Jesus Christ. It has to be turned on. And so Adam fell. Most historians and Rabbis study the original language, agree that Adam was 33 when he sinned. That's why Jesus was 33 when he died for all sin. See, God doesn't just choose things randomly. God's very intentional and God's very, very methodical. He works in patterns. He works in number. He created the numerical systems so that we would have a clock, so that we would understand the times and the seasons that we're living in, so that we would know what we ought to do. That's a, it's a car anointing. That's what it's for. They were the keepers of time. They were the ones that told Israel what time it was. 
And so God even went farther than that. He created a, a weekly time clock called a Shabbat to help them keep time. Every seventh day was a day of rest, a Shabbat for them. He created the moon, set it there in place. So that every new moon, they knew that started a new month. You know, it, it was the monthly calendar, not the solar, which is what we use now. See, it's a perversion. Go by the month. Go by the moon. The new moon. And, you know, people have said for years that the moon represents the church. The sun represents Christ. Christ. The moon has no light of its own. It only receives the light of the sun. So that's like the church, a reflection of his light. And so he set new moons to keep time, to keep time, to understand the time, a new moon, a new month. And then he went even farther than that. Within the month, then he created this clock for years so that they could keep the year. And he created the Moedim or the seven major feasts throughout the year that they were to keep. And, you know, that's what ended Israel into Babylon was because they stopped keeping the feast. They stopped keeping the, the Shemitah. They didn't celebrate it anymore. They stopped celebrating the Jubilee. Did you know that? They began to disobey the Lord and all the things he told them not to do. But what God was really looking at was his time clock. And so he allowed them to be carried away. And Jeremiah prophesied about it and, you know, he ended up in jail for a while because <laughs> of what he said. He told the truth. But he set up this yearly clock. And this, it's, it's, a, it's an eternal clock. It's a destiny clock. It's God's time clock. And I've been tell, I'm telling you, it's been, it's been counting upwards now to the time that we're living in. Okay, I'm just giving you a little foundation. Give you a little. I just heard this this morning. Okay, right now I'm just um, I'm giving you some evidence that God's right on time. That he knows exactly what he's doing. He's got the, I'm telling you, nothing is happening by, ch by, by chance. A true Hebrew does not believe in, um, what's the word? Coincidences. They believe that everything is divinely ordered by the Lord. There are things happening. And it's by God's divine design. And so I thought, I thought this was really cool. We know now from history. I'm going to change verses here. I'm going to go to Deuteronomy if you want to turn there with me real quick. I'm not going to stay there long. But I'm just setting the stage. Some stuff that I just learned. And I thought this is really, this is God. Oh, this is so God. He is so cool. Thank you, Lord. Now, there it is. And so Deuteronomy chapter 30. Starting in verse 1. It says, And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before thee. So you got a choice, just like Adam, two trees. And thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord thy God hath driven thee. Verse 2, And, sh and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul. Verse 3, when you're talking about a reset here, this is the reset we're looking for. This is the awakening we're looking for. That then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations where the Lord thy God has scattered thee. Now I know that he's talking to Israel in that, but we've been engrafted in. So every promise that was made to Israel is also made to every believer. We can now receive it. We didn't, we didn't replace them. It's not replacement theology we join them it's called union it's becoming one it's becoming the family of god okay and so god still honors his promises to the nation of israel and actually israel is a clock that we can watch and as we see these things happening we know that the end is drawing near and we see all of, we see all of the things that daniel talked about have already taking place or are taking place right now. There's just one or two that have not happened yet. And it says that when they begin to return home, that's called a Iliar, if I say it right, Ali, Aliyah, make it Aliyah, or whatever. It's returning back to Israel. Jews from all over the world for years now have been returning back to Israel, coming back to the homeland. God is putting it in their heart 
to come back. Why? It's for a purpose. It's the f- fulfillment of Scripture. But get this. This is what I didn't know. This is what was really cool. And if I can find it, if I can get on the right page. Oh, Jesus. Getting a little drunk here in the spirit. I get weird. Anyway, this Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 3 is, well, let's say it like this. Um, 1948, the Gregorian calendar, which would have been 5708 in the Hebraic calendar. Are you with me? Two different calendars, keeping two different times, but they're actually the same. It's fallen. The God has a plan. He has a time clock. What happened in 1948? Israel, right? It was established as a nation again. Okay. In the year 5708 on the biblical calendar. Guess what verse in the Bible, Deuteronomy 30, verse 3 is? Verse 5708. The exact verse. On that exact year, according to that verse, then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and return and gather thee, gather thee from all the nations where the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. So God fulfilled that scripture. He reestablished Israel as a nation again. He did exactly what he said, the exact verse. So that, got, that got me pretty excited. You know, God is on time. I'm telling you, his clock is perfect. Okay. So we got to understand that God has a plan here. 2001 was the seventh year Shemitah year. You know what happened? Again, we have a choice in all of this, good or bad. If we choose to do the wrong things, then we're going to reap. The blood moons are a sign of judgment and things not good. It could be good if you're doing the right things. But in 2001, what happened? Well, that happened. I just learned this morning. Just listen to somebody else that's smarter than me. That's the year, it was a Shemitah year, and it's the year that the U.S., the U.N., the E.U., and Russia formed a group, they call it the quartet or whatever, they formed this group. What did that group do? It divided Israel. They decided it needed to be Palestine. The Palestinians said, I don't understand all that, but I know that's what happened. They brought division to Israel. Is that a good thing? No. That's not a good thing. They brought a curse on us, on all four of those countries. <laughs> Could it be that, you know, they say that uh, God will give you leaders as judgment. If it's a divine judgment, God will give you a good leader. If, it's, if you've been doing the wrong things and God judges it, he'll give you a bad leader. <laughs> and I think from uh, we've had some bad leaders up into this. 2008, another Shemitah year, stock market crashed in the U.S. Isn't that something? Mm-hmm. 2015, and again, the overlaps was 15, 16. There was, again, four blood moods. And that's when, in 2015, at the beginning of 2016 in January, that Hebrew year, 5776, isn't that interesting? 776, what happened concerning this nation in 776? 1776 independence yeah we became a nation didn't we we declared our independence from britain well in that year i stepped into heaven was and the holy spirit again took me somewhere i'd never been took me into the council of 70 or the heavenly sanhedrin court and there were documents in my hand that i was to present to the I don't know what you want to call them. Those that were seated there on that council. Okay. And my understanding was it was that um, Donald J. Trump would be the next president of the United States. This was at the beginning of 2016 in a Shemitah. So heaven declared that Trump would be president in that Shemitah. And it happened just exactly like God said it would. Not like man thought it would. And so we're at another Shemitah right now, 2022 going into 23. The Hebrew years of 57, 82, 83. It all overlaps there. So we're in this year. So we need to understand the, the God clock, the time clock of what God is doing. Okay, back to where I was. I'm jumping around. 
all over the place. Where did I go? There it is. Okay. So that should, you know, that should prove to us, if nothing else, that God is true. God's word is true. That his timing is perfect. He knows what he's doing. He's not late. They've always, I've always said that God's not early. God's not late. He's always right on time. Not on our time. On his time. His appointed times. These Moedims. Moeds. Okay. So. Here we are. And we just read before Genesis 6.3. That was the first place that 120 was mentioned. The second place that 120 is mentioned in the Bible has to do with a guy named Moses. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 34, and I'm not going to go there, but it's, guess how old Moses was when he died? 120, exactly, to the day. Exactly 120 years old. It's another sign. So 120 speaks of these shifts that take place. Something, a promise that God fulfills, something that changes. Moses' death represented the old way, the old thing dying, and then after his death, they entered into the promised land. Okay, and a third 120 is found in Acts chapter 2, day of Pentecost. You know what happened. The 120 are gathered in an upper room, and the Spirit falls, and, and the church fulfills that feast in the natural, in this realm. See, they fulfilled the feast of Passover in this realm. The Lamb of God, Jesus, was crucified on a cross in Jerusalem. Um, and now, you know... The third thing, so then the Feast of Pentecost is fulfilled. The only feast that has not been fulfilled by the church in this realm is tabernacles. Where God comes, and I believe it's the return of Christ, tabernacles among his people. And sets up his temple, if you will, in Jerusalem. His kingdom, his headquarters to rule and reign over everything for a thousand years. Okay, so let me go over Shemitah. Understand these seven-year cycles, and I believe we're at the end, we're in the seventh year. So this is just just seven represents resting. Okay, so we are to enter into His rest now, not stop working, but enter into His rest. When you're doing His will, it's it's not hard. It's a joy. It's not a job. It's a joy when you know that God spoke to you and you're doing what He told you to do. It's your joy to serve Him, isn't it? It's a joy to fulfill the word. It's, if God tells you to give $5,000 to somebody, it isn't begrudgingly. If you know you heard from God and you want to serve him, it's a joy to, to serve him because you know there's a greater blessing coming. Because when you give, you're believing for that. I don't believe for the hundredfold blessing anymore. I'm moving into the Abrahamic promise of a thousandfold blessing. He promised a thousandfold blessing. We can have it through Abraham, the father of our faith. God's no respecter of persons. Just believe him for it. Okay, so Shemitah. Here's your Hebrew lesson. What time is it? Oh, you guys got to go. You're going to miss it, but you can get it later. But I'm going to do this really fast. Shemitah. You don't have to understand all the letters, but it's a shin, a mem, a yod, a tet, and a hey. Okay, here's what's important. <laughs> Did I just cuss? No, that wasn't cussing. Anyway, shin, mem, yod, tet, hey. <laughs> we can make a song out of it, a dance, yeah. Here's what's important. Every letter has a numerical value. Every word has a numerical value. Just add up the numerical value of the letters. I'm no dummy, but I can add. Okay. Anyway, so add up those numbers. What's key here, there's two, there's two numerical values. The large and the small, whether you drop the zero or you keep the zero. Both are just as equal and significant. The numerical value of Shemitah, the small numerical value, the gematria, if you will, is 22. What year are we in? 22. It's a Shemitah year. But it means more than that. 22 is the fullness of the 22 living letters. The 22 living letters represent the full word of God. The fullness of his voice. Him accomplishing everything. The 22nd letter is the letter Tav, which in the Hebrew originally was pictures. It's the picture of a cross. It's the letter that represents full redemption of man. <laughs> the full redemption. Of all things. The restoration of all things. Because the 22 then it's a circle. So 22 brings you back to one. Which is Aleph. Which is the father. See through the cross. God brought man back to the father. Hebrew makes perfect sense. It does. It's, it's perfect in every way. If we understand it. And so. Looking at that. 
looking at the letters by the pictures, this is what my definition, if you will, of Shemitah. In my understanding, by the Spirit, looking at the pictures of these letters and understanding the letters and who they are and what they do. Here's what Shemitah means. In the Shemitah year, which we're in, by the power of his hand, God transforms the earth into a garden like heaven. That's what Shemitah, that was always the desire of God. The seventh year was a year of rest. Israel stopped celebrating that, stopped letting the land rest, stopped letting the animals rest for a year, just kept working and striving, laboring, trying to do enough work. We can't do enough work to please God. That's why you have to rest, because Jesus did enough work for all of us. The finished work of the cross. So by the power of his hand, see, God transforms, God works, that invisible hand working behind the scenes. By faith, we believe and we receive. The earth is being transformed back into a garden. That's called the new heaven and a new earth. It's, a, it's the great transformation. It is the great reset. It is the great awakening. It's the great changing of the old passing away, but all things becoming new. It started with you. It started with me. But he's not finished. All of creation is moaning and groaning, waiting for the manifestations of the sons of gods to appear. That's us. So in a Shemitah, yes, that's what God does. So you can only imagine at the end of the last Shemitah that God has ever designed, the end of 6,000 years, okay? And so you go back when Adam sinned, which is uh, 5971 or something like that in, in, the, in the Hebrew calendar, and you go all the way, you know, to here. If you go, I don't even know what I was talking about. I, I lost track. What was I saying? Dear Lord. 6,000 years. So if you go forward 6,000 years from the day that Adam sinned, was kicked out of the garden, 6,000 years would bring us to 2029, which just happens to be another Shemitah year. Interesting, huh? And I believe it's the last Shemitah. I believe it is when everything is completely the beginning of the ending, restoration of all things. Where the earth is transformed back into a garden, a, a house of habitation where God lives with us and where we live with him. That's what I'm believing right now. Okay, let me go to the word jubilee real quick. Jubilee, Yod Vav Bet Lamed. Yod Vav Bet Lamed. Okay, what's really cool, jubilee, I, I think I told you this a couple weeks ago, but the large numerical value of that word is 48. A jubilee. 48, 1948, Israel becomes a nation again. God gives them back their land. It also, in the small geometry, is 12, which is very significant because that's the number of God's government. A jubilee is God's government at work on the earth. A jubilee is when God's kingdom is reestablished. Everything that was lost, that was stolen, was marred or decayed or whatever, doesn't matter. All the bad stuff that people did, and they're reaping what they sowed. In a jubilee, it's all forgotten, it's all forgiven, and it's all restored. It's all given back. It's all gotten back. And see, so I'm believing that everything's coming back. That we have the right to claim it. We have the right to decree it. We have the right to believe for it. That everything the enemy has stolen is coming back. You're going to get it all back. It's a full, it's the great jubilee of all jubilees. <laughs> it's a seven-year season of restoration. That we're entering into. Now the Jews would tell you it begins in the fall in September. It's okay, but by faith I'm accessing it early, okay? I'm going after it early through Jesus Christ who is my jubilee. He's the fullness of all jubilees. He did it all. He is our jubilee in the spirit. But there's a natural occurrence. There's a natural outworking of everything in the Bible. It's been that way from the beginning. And it's going to be that way in the ending. So jubilee, this 48... And this 12, by the letters, this is what jubilee means. And this is the last thing I'm going to say. By the letters, looking at the pictures, by the Spirit, understanding what God is saying. Understanding the time and the season that we're in. This moed, that we're, we're at the end of the thing, not the beginning. We're, we're completing it. We're at the fullness of time. 
I hope you understand that. God's clock has been ticking. And it's about to run out of the time for this creation. Everything's about to be fulfilled that's been written. Oh, glory to God. I'm telling you, praise God. By the letters, Jubilee. This is what Jubilee. And I believe we're in a Jubilee. We're in the beginning. They'll say it begins in the fall. Okay, I'm just starting early. We're in a Jubilee. I'm believing God for everything to come back in the next year. Amen. <laughs> because that you look at the Shemitahs, you don't look at the seventh year. It's what happens in the very next year, the first year of the next Shemitah cycle. You see the outworking of all that God did in the last seven-year season. That's when you reap it all. That's when it all takes place. That's when you receive it. You receive the kingdom. So by the letters, this is what you believe means. I know I've been throwing this carrot out in front of you. Here you go. By the power of God's hand, his sons and daughters once again become the authority of their house, family, and his house. Wow. By the power of God's hand, not in our work, but by the power of his hand. Think about the nail-pierced hands. By the power of his hand, his sons and daughters. Jesus was first. He was the first among many brethren to enter into glory. Are you with me? He was our first fruits. Then we're the, the rest of the fruits. And there's some fruits in here and some nuts too. But by the power of God's hand, his sons and daughters, once again, the prodigal sons, once again, become, are reestablished, are set back in order. Ordinal perfection, Sean, is brought back. Ten is the hand, is the letter uh, Yod, which is the hand. Speaks of ten, ordinal, the order, the perfect order of things. By the power of God's hand, his sons and daughters once again are reestablished, restored, become the authority over their house, the jubilee, getting everything back, taking back the authority, taking back all that was lost. But also, we are set, we are given the authority to rule and reign as ambassadors on his behalf in his house, over his house. The, that's called the kingdom, the house of God, the kingdom of God. The great Ecclesia, all the little Ecclesias together. <laughs> called out ones. Called up the mountain. Not into the valley anymore. Called up not to Mount Sinai, but called up to Mount Zion. And authority is restored. And we rule and reign with him. First in your life and then over other, all of creation. We become God's hands. That rule and reign. We become his mouthpiece. We his hands and feet. <sighs> Thank you, Lord. So I see the winds blowing. And God is raising up an army. That he prophesied about in Ezekiel chapter 37. He's going to have an army. He's going to have a family. He's going to have a garden. That we dwell in with him. A new heaven, a new earth, a new Eden. The two joined back together. What Adam lost. Jesus bought back. And we're stepping into it. It's the end of time of this creation. And then there's a new time. Hallelujah. There's a thousand year reign. And then there's an eight of new beginning. And we're with him forever and ever and ever. And you know what? I don't believe we ever will end Learning and receiving the revelation, the mysteries of our Father. You want to know what you do after that time? You're just in awe of Him. <laughs> of everything that He is. We just continue to learn who He is. Grow with Him. Love with Him. Love in Him. Thank you. Amen.